Hello there, folks. I am your host, the Sea Monster, and I bid you all welcome to my two-part essay video series on Cloverfield. Released in January of 2008, Cloverfield was directed by Matt Reeves, a filmmaker who would go on to be known for doing films such as Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, War for the Planet of the Apes, and The Batman 2022. The film was also produced by J.J. Abrams under his production company Bad Robot, a fact which will become relevant as we progress in the series. Now, Cloverfield is a rather fascinating case, one that I've had a strong level of interest in discussing because I have some things to say regarding its marketing and the phenomenon that was brought about by said marketing, as well as the impact that it had on what is now considered to be the Cloverfield franchise or Cloververse, as some people may refer to it as. All that will be discussed in part two, however. For this video, which is part one, by the way, we will be discussing the film Cloverfield itself, and how it holds up in terms of storytelling and character work, as well as the technical side of filmmaking. This series will discuss the film's overall quality, leaning mostly on the side of how well the film holds up by an objective standard, with a few light tinges of personal slash subjective thoughts sprinkled here and there. All of that will be taken into account as we come to an overall conclusion by the end of this series. So, now that we have laid out the necessary groundwork, let's turn on our video cameras and document this film with this series. Let's get right into it, basically. So let's go over a little bit on what Cloverfield is about, just so that we have a good idea of what we'll be discussing here. The film revolves around a group of young adults, particularly Robert Hawkins, played by Michael Stahl David, who has a going away party thrown for him by his friends. However, the party is unexpectedly cut short when a mysterious giant monster attacks New York City. They try to leave the city, but the monster subverts that plan and kills Rob's brother, Jason, played by Mike Vogel. Then Rob finds out that his former girlfriend, Beth McIntyre, played by Odette Yutzman, whom he still retains romantic feelings for, is trapped in her apartment. So he takes the initiative to try to rescue her while being accompanied by his brother's girlfriend, Lily Ford, played by Jessica Lucas, his friend Hudson Platt, played by T.J. Miller, and Marlena Diamond, played by Lizzie Kaplan. During this trek through Manhattan, they have several harrowing encounters with the monster as well as smaller but equally as deadly parasitic creatures along the way, while racing against the clock to get to Beth before the city is completely destroyed. All of these events are documented by HUD over the course of the night using Rob's camera while the footage itself is established to have been recovered by the US government after the fact. So the first thing I want to talk about are the characters, which are pretty much the easiest to go into because the characters aren't exactly complex, perhaps not even the most believable in terms of motivation, but at the same time, they don't really need to be complex in order to be well-realized warts and all. So might as well get into them first. Rob Hawkins, despite having broken up with Beth in order to pursue the position of vice president for a company in Japan, still has feelings for her and is shown to have not moved on from her or those feelings, such as when he sees her at his party with another man. He has regrets about letting her go and then he goes on to be hell-bent in saving her when he receives a phone call from her for help. From a few visible instances during his farewell party to his expression of desperation to the military, he has quite a bit of justification for trying to reach her when the monster attacks and when he receives the voicemail indicating that her life is in jeopardy. Overall, Rob Hawkins isn't the deepest of main characters, but he still has a solid enough foundation to make him worth rooting for in his quest to save the woman he loves, which adds to the tragedy of their eventual demise. Next, we have the characters who accompany Rob in his quest. Lily is given a pretty good reason to join Rob considering she just witnessed her boyfriend being murdered by Clover and that Beth is a good friend of hers. So she would very much want Rob to succeed in getting to Midtown alive and saving Beth. I will say though that the amount of rigorous, intense running that Lily does throughout the course of this film is crazy considering that she is clearly wearing high heels throughout the duration of her screen time. Y'all laughed when Jurassic World did this with Bryce Dallas Howard's character, but probably didn't even notice when Lily in Cloverfield was doing the same thing, and for a longer in-universe duration. Not a huge deal, you know, just a little something-something that I just so happen to have caught. 
Regardless, Lily is a solid enough side character who has a strongly justified reason for coming with Rob on what may very well be a suicide mission. Next up we have HUD. He basically serves as the film's comic relief, whose humor is mainly portrayed as awkward interjections regarding the situation. I will admit that his humor is a bit hit or miss. Sometimes the humor is well placed and well executed, but not so much in other instances. He also has a bit of an interest in Marlena Diamond, as demonstrated in their interactions with each other. He certainly comes off as awkward to her, but in the sense that he's trying to go in her favor, to open up the possibility of the two being an item. He also has a good reason to join the mission in saving Beth as Rob's best friend who, despite his reluctance, would certainly want to make sure he gets out of the city safe. He also serves as the film's primary source of documentation of its events, and he even vocally adds an in-universe justification for keeping the camera on him and running for a good portion of the night. That reason being how people are going to want to know how it all went down as a way to document Clover's attack through a boots on the ground unbiased POV. HUD isn't exactly a great character by any stretch and certainly not a particularly complex character, but he serves his purpose rather well. Marlena is the most contentious of the bunch in terms of justification for joining Rob. Even as a friend of Lily's, she's the one who is the most vocal about getting out of the city immediately regardless of Beth's current state of things. The best faith interpretation of Marlena's place in this plot is that she is shown to be a good enough person and to be caring enough about the others to stick around despite her better judgment, such as how she accompanies them because Lily is part of the group and when she saves HUD from a parasite in the tunnels, only to have her fate be unfortunately sealed at a moment's notice. So, Marlena's place in the plot is not quite as justified as the others, but she she's, she's serviceable. She's pretty much fine, overall. Not to mention Lizzie Kaplan is good in the film. In fact, the cast as a whole is pretty good, overall. But, uh, I digress. So now, on to the matter of Beth. Elizabeth McIntyre, or Beth for short, is the girlfriend of Rob or at least former girlfriend by the time of the main events of the film. After they spent a night together, the two went on to have a good romantic day in Coney Island. At some point after that, however, the two broke up with implications that Rob hadn't talked to her for weeks, and possibly due to him pursuing his vice president position in Japan. Beth brings another guy over named Travis to Rob's going away party to meet with Lily, and this clearly doesn't sit well with Rob deep down. In her testimony to Rob, which HUD convinces her to do, Beth goes on to express that she'll genuinely miss him when he leaves. Her body language and tone of voice make this rather apparent. After leaving the party, we don't see or hear from Beth until her phone call to Rob after the monster makes landfall. She essentially goes on to be a damsel in distress, but for good reason, because she is badly injured as a result of the monster having attacked or knocked over her apartment in Midtown prompting Rob to try to go there to rescue her. After they finally reach her, Rob, Lily, and Hud find Beth impaled by a piece of wall on her chest. I must admit, her injury looks as if she should have bled out before they got to her, and the intense pain that she feels probably should have hindered her significantly in her running with her friends to the extraction zone near the Grand Central Terminal. Even with an adrenaline rush, she would have had a much harder time than she is shown to have had trying to run with Rob and company at the pace that they're in. Nonetheless, Beth, along with Rob and Hud, is unable to make it to the end. Once again, much like her castmates, Beth isn't exactly a deep character by any stretch, but she serves the plot well, especially as a reason for our protagonists to put themselves in crazy, harrowing situations involving a giant monster. Now, as we get into what the film has going on in terms of anything deep like, oh, let's say, a thematic core, there isn't much here. Though I will say that it does have a core of how one must hold on to the things which are invaluable and that they care about more than anything in the world, for those precious things may be gone and even at an instant. Rob caring about and loving Beth as much as he does and how much she cares about and loves him deep down 
gives Rob realization that he will regret not staying with her for the rest of his life if he doesn't try to make amends, get back to her, and tell her how much she truly means to him. This was made apparent with Jason's conversation with his brother right before the first moment in Clover's attack. The conversation between Rob and Lily in the tunnels is also a good showcase of this thematic core where Rob and Lily express their regrets to each other about the things that they said to their beloved ones. Rob goes on to say that Jason knew that Lily loved him no matter what, and now Rob hopes to get to Beth so that he can get that last chance to let her know that he loves her, as well as to make amends with her. Again, the thematic core isn't very significant, but there is something to pull from it, and it is fairly prevalent enough in parts to where it's kind of hard to ignore. So even with the film mainly being a showcasing of the found footage horror format being implemented into a kaiju film, I still can't help but come to the conclusion that screenwriter Drew Goddard had deliberately added some depth to the film's story and character work just to add that much more meat to its metaphorical bones. Now, as far as the giant monster, designated Clover, is concerned, the creature is characterized as very animalistic throughout the film. The crew for the film have stated that Clover is supposed to be an infant that's lost in a world that it doesn't understand while looking for its parent, or parents. There are moments intermittently where that can be interpreted, but without that detail, one can certainly still get the idea that Clover is an animal that's been placed in an environment that is confusing and foreign to it, while also trying to survive attacks which it doesn't understand. As far as the animalistic nature is concerned, Clover is established to have eaten various people for sustenance, as well as trying to avoid or even lashes out in self-defense against foreign hostile activity towards it. The parasites that drop off of Clover could either be interpreted as part of its self-defense system, or they could be creatures that have resided on it for transport until it reached landfall so that they would go on a hunt of their own. The scene where Clover kills Hud at the end of the film features a moment where the creature displays a sense of curiosity in the sight of Hud standing in front of it before recognizing him as food. The creature's physiology is also really neat. From its unusual, almost insectoid body structure to amphibian-like features such as its ability to go underwater for periods of time, as well as breathing sacs on both sides of its head to imply its ability to breathe in oxygen, which adds to the strange and even unsettling design. Not to mention, Clover also has smaller arms in its thigh area, for a very apparent purpose for snatching up little, juicy, crunchy humans for it to put in its large mouthful of big serrated teeth. So Clover isn't much more than a really large, really strange animal as far as characterization is concerned, but that characterization is still fairly well done in giving us a well-realized monster for our humans to run away from, as well as to give us a good enough reason to be scared by it. So we've gone over the characters and thematic core, what have you, but now let's get into the technical side of things. The technical side of things in Cloverfield is pretty strong, with a lot of great effects throughout the film, many of which still holding up to this day. It's astonishing that this film was made with only the budget of 25 million US dollars, Yet it looks as if it was made for much more than that, especially considering the amount of citywide destruction and carnage which we see throughout the film. The monster is very well rendered in all of its CG glory, considering its limited screen time and the deliberate way the film is shot, allowing the filmmakers to stretch their budget to make the monster look as good as possible when it is on screen. The same principle applies to the monster's parasites, which appear in the dark with very limited lighting, such as in the tunnel sequence. Though there is one brief but rather unfortunate moment where a parasite appears after Beth is rescued, and the CGI on that isn't very good. Despite that moment and perhaps a few other very brief hiccups in the CGI here and there, which could easily be chalked up to the film's age, the film boasts some very impressive effects and production value, even with a considerably smaller budget than your average giant monster movie from Hollywood these days. The film also features plenty of harrowing and effective sequences of horror. While there are those who would criticize the shaky cam throughout the film, it adds a strong sense of authenticity and immersion to the proceedings when showcasing the chaos ensuing at various points as a result of the monster's attack or even the frantic nature of characters being taken out of a room due to one of their own suffering from the gruesome results of a bite. I mean, the camera's gonna shake a lot, especially if the cameraman has a survival instinct and is pretty much running throughout the film, so... I mean, ask me, that's realistic. However, one issue I do take with the scary bits of the film is that 
Clover does appear out of nowhere in a stealthier fashion than one would expect during quite a few scenes. One instance is the Brooklyn Bridge sequence, where the monster rises from the water and sways its tail onto the bridge, causing its destruction as well as many deaths, including the death of Jason Hawkins. The main issue being that there is a helicopter with a searchlight flying around as well as various lights on the bridge that would naturally reflect on the monster's wet skin, thus illuminating it and making its presence known to the panicked crowd before the tail comes down. Perhaps the lights weren't enough and the monster was still shrouded in enough shadows to where the scare was still effective, so that fact could potentially balance itself out. And not to mention a crowd that panicked and scared would probably have no idea what to really do right away, even if the monster was visible, so I guess that balances out. However, there's more instances where Clover just kind of comes out of nowhere for the sake of a scare. A second one of said instances that I want to address is where Rob and company are walking down the street discussing about the inavailability of police and fire and rescue when the monster suddenly steps in front of them and when the military appears behind them, thus a battle ensues. As much of an intense visual spectacle as it is, the sequence has some issues. First of all, how did the military appear like that without the sounds of their heavy machinery rolling in? Second of all, why didn't the soldiers announce their presence to Rob and company and tell them to get off the streets or to go to a rendezvous point for evac? Third, how was the monster able to appear with as little noise or reverb from its footsteps, thus allowing it to make its appearance in front of our heroes a scary surprise? I mean, it's not like Clover is going out of its way to sneak up on people just to get a good scare out of them. Now granted, there are sounds of explosions and other sorts of commotion in the background beforehand, thus hinting at the possibility of the monster appearing. However, it's still not enough for me to deem this sequence as totally logically sound. Another scare moment involving Clover that's pretty awkward is one which occurs during the helicopter sequence. After our remaining heroes witness the monster being bombed to high heaven, there is a brief moment where it's believed that the bombing run was a success until the monster suddenly attacks the helicopter that our heroes are in and send it crashing down. Up to that point, the scene was very well done, where we get the spectacle of seeing Clover in full, as well as the bombing which is brought down on the creature. But then there is the question of how was Clover able to lunge upward at the helicopter the way that it does, and more importantly, why wasn't the helicopter which our heroes are being transported in not getting as far away as possible from where Clover is, just in case the creature goes after them. These questionable bits do affect the scene's overall quality due to how, if the monster doesn't attack the way it does, from as far upward of a distance as it does, the helicopter crash doesn't occur, which in turn would result in the ending no longer being possible. I will say though that the helicopter crash sequence is very well executed in terms of immersing the audience and the feeling of the chopper going down suddenly, along with the potential mortality which will come upon impact. Also, I do appreciate that the aftermath of the crash resulted in not only the deaths of the chopper's pilots, but also Rob having sustained a significant injury in his leg. Unlike in something like Kong Skull Island, where several major characters are able to remain unscathed after enduring insane helicopter crashes. So, not the most realistic sequence overall, but points for realism in certain aspects. Now before I go any further, I do want to highlight one scare sequence involving Clover that actually is logically sound. And that is right after when Rob, Lily, and HUD are patching Beth up before they leave. The monster shows up out of focus and in the background only to let out a roar and make its presence known. So then HUD zooms in on the creature as it's approaching the apartment complex. It's an effective scare, and it's built up in a logical, well-executed manner. So, there's that. Now, the last scene that I want to discuss is the monster's final on-screen appearance where it kills HUD. First, the pros. HUD's sense of overwhelming shock and terror as Clover stands right in front of him and sees him is very well captured by T.J. Miller. The CGI on the creature is well rendered and it's lit in a natural way to where it looks nigh-realistic, and the sound design of HUD getting gobbled up is really well done in illustrating the gruesome nature of his death. So there's the pros. Now, onto the cons. The fact that Clover is able to appear and walk into Central Park while HUD and Beth are patching up Rob without any one of them seeing it is kinda dumb. 
I know Beth and HUD are hyper-focused on getting Rob back on his feet and to seek shelter away from the hammer-down protocol, regardless of their bleak circumstances, but that still doesn't justify them not seeing the monster come up in an open field, as we know Central Park to be, especially considering the size of this creature. Another con, and this is perhaps a bit of a one-two punch here, Wow, is that camera not only durable, but lucky as heck. Now yes, Rob's camera, which HUD carries for the majority of the film, is depicted to have undergone a lot of abuse throughout their trek from all the trips and falls that HUD and the camera endure. But when Clover starts killing HUD, not only is it insane how the camera was able to survive the force from the monster chomping down on HUD, but also, it is extremely lucky that only HUD's bottom half was eaten because otherwise, Rob and Beth wouldn't be able to make their final testimonies, and all that footage that was taken throughout the night would be lost forever. So yeah, the horror sequences involving Clover look well as far as mere spectacle is concerned, but there are some pretty flawed mechanics in how they're executed, especially when you put some thought into them. Now we also have the parasites, which serve to add an extra fear factor to the proceedings, even when Clover is off screen, to where the subway tunnel sequence and the medical center scene stand out as the film's highlights in terms of suspense and horror. The tunnel sequence is really well executed in terms of how it illustrates the parasites threatening to overwhelm our heroes in the tunnel, as well as in how the scene builds up to HUD seeing them via night vision, and illustrating how much danger him and his friends are truly in especially with the late of darkness and very limited lighting from the camera, adds to the sheer terror from the parasites coming from just about anywhere. And that sense of terror persists for the rest of the duration of the film. It even pays off for a moment, such as when our heroes encounter a parasite after rescuing Beth. The film also does a great job at teasing the parasites coming in later, such as in the electronic store scene where HUD and a bunch of other guys are watching the news footage of people getting attacked by the critters. Then we have the scene where our heroes are taken in by the military and into a makeshift medical wing where we see the many casualties of Clover's attack. We also get foreshadowing of Marlena's inevitable horrific fate where we briefly catch the remains of a parasite victim and how it's referred to as a bite, referencing the deadly bite that the parasites inflict onto their prey. A great thing about the horror, as well as even to an extent the world building in Cloverfield, is that we only learn as much about Clover, the parasites, and the situation overall as the characters do, if not a little more so than the characters, maintaining the air of mystery surrounding where the creatures came from, while still giving us little tidbits of info regarding how they operate. Then we have Marlena's death scene, which is amazingly built up too. First, we see a bit of Marlena getting dizzy, which stands as a side effect of her getting bitten, which is interpreted as her primarily having suffered a significant loss of blood as a result of the bite that she endured, as Lily goes on to express how she needs to go see a doctor. Then, after a bit of time passing in-universe, we suddenly see Marlena bleeding from her eyes, then her nose, then we see her coughing out blood profusely as she's being taken away while HUD, Rob, and Lily are also being taken out of the room. Finally, from right outside of a quarantine area, we see the silhouette of Marlena having her abdomen inflate and explode into a gruesome, bloody mess. The moment comes in suddenly and with very little warning, and hits the characters and by extension the audience like a freight train as there is a sudden, frantic nature of the medical staff catching Marlena's condition, getting radically worse and worse, and our heroes being taken out of the room without warning, only for the moment to really settle in as our heroes process that Marlena is well and truly gone. Marlena's death sequence is an excellent showcasing of how frightening Clover and the Parasites are, as well as their potential to cause further widespread damage should they not be stopped. Hence why the stakes are as high as they are for Rob to get to Beth in time before the military plays its trump card. So overall, while some of the mechanics in certain scenes are in a rather questionable if not flawed state, the horror sequences involving Clover, and especially involving the parasites, as well as the damage that they inflict with their bites, is still well done and offers some great scary highlights. Now, still going on about the film's suspense, horror, terror aspects, and so on, there is also a strong realistic vibe given off in the environment of New York City being attacked by the monster. Tons of panicked crowds of people with many running in various directions, 
quieter and inactive streets, aside from the occasional sounds of the monster or the military, and even a break-in into an electronics store all add to the atmosphere of a city in total chaos that goes on to be under martial law throughout the night. Now, at the time of the film's release, one critic, whom I won't say the name of for the sake of being nice and not wishing for anyone to dogpile on them, which I shouldn't have to say, but please don't dogpile on anyone who doesn't need slash deserve to be dogpiled on, okay? So anyway, one critic reviewed the film at the time of its release and criticized it for how certain parts of the monster attack in New York and knocking down buildings and monuments as people run away and scream in terror makes the film too reminiscent of 9-11. First of all, a bunch of buildings and monuments getting destroyed is something which one would have to come to expect when seeing a giant monster movie, or a disaster movie in general. Second of all, while I understand the reference to 9-11 considering that the film's events take place in New York City, criticizing the film for being set in New York City is a weak argument because such criticism would imply that writers would have to limit or even restrict certain settings from these kinds of stories. If a giant monster were to actually exist, it could attack anywhere, whether it's New York, Chicago, San Francisco, Tokyo, Hong Kong, you name it, it wouldn't matter. So it would make sense for a monster that appeared from the ocean to attack a city like New York City of all places. In fact, I'm pretty sure this reviewer would criticize the film for being too reminiscent of 9-11 regardless of what big city it takes place in. Because there are plenty of cities in the world, let alone in the US, with a substantial amount of tall buildings and monuments that something like a kaiju could easily knock down. Not to mention, if you ask me, Cloverfield is among the best in terms of monster movies that realistically portray the effects of a kaiju attack on people and their environment. The film doesn't sensationalize or glorify the carnage which Clover causes. It shows how terrifying a situation like that would be. The giant monster is basically a device being used to illustrate that kind of horror. There's a world of difference between a movie like Godzilla vs. Kong, which features kaiju mayhem as part of spectacle from seeing giant monsters fighting each other, and a movie like Cloverfield, which features kaiju-sized mayhem to showcase how scary something like a kaiju attack would be for the civilians who are caught in the middle. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that Cloverfield does a great job at realistically portraying the atmosphere of a sudden monster attack in a big city. If it hits some people too close to home, that's perfectly understandable, but that doesn't mean we should put limitations on art in general or what a kaiju film may be capable of showcasing, just because some people may not want to see it. And so, with all that said, that pretty much covers the story, characters, and technical aspects in Cloverfield, and brings us to an end on part one of this essay video series. Now, usually I would start going into my overall conclusions on the film, and this video would only be a standalone one-off. But, considering the film's unique marketing campaign, as well as considering how such a campaign would go on to impact the film post-release, as well as the Cloverfield franchise as a whole, there is so much to untangle regarding that, which has left me with no other alternative but to devote part two to it, as well as the conclusion on the film's overall quality. So stay tuned for that. Nonetheless, I thank you all for watching part one of my essay video series on Cloverfield, and until the next part, I will see you all later.